Check out today's piece of Otaku Daikun fan art. Hey, it's me in my new outfit, looking out into a beautiful starry sky. It definitely makes me feel like I'm in a JRPG or something. I really appreciate how y'all are embracing these new designs. Thank you so much, Kazuna Astral. Welcome back to Otaku Daikun! Dai here! Last time, we went over Fate Grand Order's Oku event because it serves as a prelude to today's topic, the fourth law spelled Yuga Kshetra, Samsara of Genesis and Terminus, more loosely called the Indian law spelled. Kama, the Oku event's antagonist, managed to escape from this law spelled, but the same cannot be said for most of the other Indian deities. Let's start with Arjuna. We've already been introduced to him in the American singularity, but as a refresher, he's the central hero of the Indian epic poem Mahabharata. He's famous for being the rival of Karna, the hero of charity from the same story. This rivalry stems from a great war in the poem known as the Kurukshetra War, in which two opposing families, the Pandavas and Kauravas, fought in many bloody battles. In proper human history, Arjuna prevails in this war, defeating Karna through methods he later deems underhanded and dishonorable. He is able to move on from the conflict, devoting himself to peace and recompense. For this lost belt, however, Arjuna doesn't make it through the end of the war. He comes to see the fighting as senseless bloodshed, spurred by humanity's imperfections. As such, he seeks to bring about a perfect world rid of these flaws, and acts toward the rebirth of an ideal world. Honestly, it's not all that different than what Getia had envisioned. His method, however, is both different and ironic. You see, Arjuna has a darker side to his personality, a flaw that drives him to hate and plot evils against his enemies. In order to correct humanity's flaws, he buries his own and seeks to become divine. Arjuna's closest friend, Krishna, was an avatar of Vishnu, one of the most powerful gods in the Indian pantheon. He used this connection to somehow absorb and acquire Vishnu's power for himself. With such a strong divinity in his grasp, Arjuna proceeded to absorb nearly all the other Indian gods, including Indra, Shiva, and Brahma. While we don't see exactly how Arjuna goes about this, it can be certain that doing so caused him great hardship. Through various phases, Arjuna absorbed most of all the Hindu gods, with the exception of Ganesha and obviously Kama and Mara, whose escape led to the Oku event. The end result of this divine burrito of sorts is Arjuna Altar, a being no longer human or servant, but a god in his own right. Much of Arjuna's personality is gone, but it's important to note that deep down, his humanity still lingers through his hatred and rivalry with Karna. In the pursuit of his perfect world, he attempts to discard these emotions, but he can never fully rid himself of them. So what does this have to do with perfecting the world? Well, in Hindu cosmology, there's this process called the Yuga Cycle, which describes the universe repeating through a cycle of four periods called Yugas. The cycle foretells a decline in virtue and an uptake in human sin that is corrected by the end of the fourth Yuga through a cataclysm, ushering in the start of a new cycle. Basically, over the span of more than four million years, the Earth goes from great prosperity and virtue to sinful disaster before restarting from the beginning, repeating this process again and again. Arjuna Altar uses his divine authority to drastically shorten this cycle so that all four Yugas come to pass in as little as a single week. He treats the cataclysm at the end of the final Yuga as an opportunity to purge what he considers to be evil from the world, remaking the next cycle as if those evil elements never existed. The people caught living through this accelerated Yuga cycle find themselves destroyed and reincarnated each time, so long as they remain healthy and continue to pray. Those that fail to appease Arjuna Altar fall victim to his noble phantasm, Mahapralaya, which is what destroys and recreates the world anew. Said victims seem to vanish from existence, with the survivors forgetting all about them. As if that weren't bad enough, during the later Yugas in each cycle, the land becomes plagued by demonic monsters called Kali. Any living beings killed by the Kali are also deemed evil, and consequently wiped from existence when Arjuna recreates the world. This leaves the people of this lost belt no other choice but to hide in their homes and pray for salvation whenever the Kali swarm their villages. Also roaming the land are sacred beasts, creatures that appear to fight the Kali on behalf of the people's prayers. 
In truth, they're just another agent of Arjuna's plan to shave off undesirable elements from the world through each cycle. During each cycle, Arjuna Altar bides his time, charging his noble phantasm from atop Vimana, the god's floating palace. You might recognize this vehicle, as it was a part of Gilgamesh's Gate of Babylon, but do realize it originates from Indian mythology. Of course, this India is a Lost Belt, only being preserved through the alien god's fantasy tree. Without it, the universe would have pruned it long ago, as it's pretty easy to tell that, by continually eliminating elements he deems unworthy, Arjuna Altar would eventually eliminate all living things but himself. That kind of stagnation is ripe for pruning. Recall that the alien god has recruited four different Alter Ego servants to oversee the Seven Lost Belts. Among them is Ashia Dolman, the crazy prick we met back in Shimosa. He's a Buddhist Onmyoji, who's thought to be the rival of Abe no Seime. As a High Servant, he is composed of three other divine elements, that being the Aztec goddess It's Papalotl, the Slavic god Chernabog, and the Japanese Heian spirit Akurio Safu. We've taken down three other Lost Belts so far, and Ashia Doman hasn't really bothered us at all. What's up with that? Isn't he supposed to be fighting us like Koyanskaya? You'd think so, but it seems these alter egos are unpredictable. After all, we already know Koyanskaya has her own motives. She's been raising different monsters as part of her NFF services, and we also know she wants to become a beast of humanity. Thus, whatever work she does for the alien god is done with these goals in mind. Ashia too has his own agenda, though it's harder to discern. At the very least, it's clear he's taken an interest in the Indian Lost Belt for its Yuga Cycle. By accelerating the process further and further, he believes the universe will come to an end, and so he encourages Arjuna Alter to continue shortening the process, conveniently not mentioning the dangers of doing so. Ashia Dolman stays on Arjuna Alter's good side as an advisor, offering in exchange to help in summoning servants who can function as Arjuna's divine generals. These heroic spirits would act as the Lokapala, protectors of the world and guardians of all directions. Each of them is granted the divine authority of one of Arjuna's many gods, and are tasked with presiding over India's respective territories. Let's go over them. By now, you should already be familiar with Prince Netza, the Chinese warrior on par with Sun Wukong. She's been around to help us in both Salem and the Chinese Lost Belt. Well, this version is summoned as one of Arjuna's Lokapala, granted the divinity of Kubera, the Lord of Wealth, which greatly enhances her strength as a berserker. In theory, this would be a good combination, but it seems Arjuna isn't as versed in lore as he should be. Turns out, Netsa's father, the heavenly king Li Jing, is synonymous with the Japanese deity Bishamonten, which you may recognize in relation to Nagao Kagetora, whom we'll meet later. This is important because these divine figures are all a big mashup of Taoist and Buddhist mythology. Kubera is similarly also referred to in conjunction with Bishamonten. In other words, Kubera and Netza's father, Li Jing, are basically the same entity. Sadly, Netza and her father don't exactly see eye to eye. In Netza's youth, she was destructive and out of control, to the point where her father had her body destroyed. It is said that Li Jing feared his child's tremendous strength, so to mash the two of them together like this for the sake of making Netza even more powerful causes internal conflict for them. Put simply, both father and child reject each other, making this Lokapala highly unstable. She only reluctantly serves Arjuna Altar because his strength is far greater than hers. Another Lokapala is Asclepius, the Greek god of medicine. He is a demigod born under Apollo and his human mother Corinus. Due to a misunderstanding, a false accusation of infidelity, however, Apollo took his rage out on Corinus, killing her while Asclepius was still in the womb. Regretting his actions, Apollo salvaged the boy and entrusted him to the care of the centaur Chiron, who was known for mentoring great heroes like Achilles. As an adult, Asclepius joined the ranks of Jason's Argonauts. Rather than combat, he specialized in medicine, and by using the blood of Gorgon, aka Medusa, he was able to formulate a potion that could resurrect the dead. This was considered the pinnacle achievement for a doctor, to save patients even after life has left them but the gods didn't see it that way. In Greek mythology, the dead go to the underworld, the domain of the god Hades. Afraid that Asclepius' new medicine would render his underworld without purpose, Hades asked Zeus to intervene. With a bolt of lightning, Zeus struck Asclepius down so that death would remain inevitable. 
Ironically, Asclepius was punished for making the greatest discovery in the history of medicine. Equally ironic is that, as a Lokapala under Arjuna Altar, he is granted the divinity of Yama, the Indian god of death in the underworld. This allows him to summon armies of the undead, and he can restore their bodies no matter how badly they're damaged in battle. Asclepius' loyalty stems from his belief that Arjuna's ideal world, which values excellence over the imperfect, also includes advancements in medical technology. Unlike the Greek gods, Asclepius feels Arjuna values him for his achievements. This lets him continue his medical research while turning a blind eye to the cruelty of Arjuna's world, a world where people are forced to forget their loved ones. Compared to the other two, Arjuna's third Lokapala is more ordinary. William Tell is a figure from a Swiss playwright, Friedrich Schiller, a hero that represents the founding of Switzerland. His story is, fundamentally, one of a humble huntsman who valued his family in the face of oppression. Tell's village faced takeover when the evil governor Gessler placed his hat upon a pole and demanded people bow down to it. When Tell refused to show reverence, Gessler had him arrested, and as punishment, Gessler forced him to demonstrate his marksmanship by shooting an arrow at an apple placed atop his son Walter's head. Should Tell miss his mark, both he and his son would be executed. As the legend goes, Tell split the apple and saved his son, but later admitted that he kept with him a second arrow in case he missed. He planned to use this second arrow to kill Gessler, and did just that when Gessler sought revenge. This legend has sublimated into two noble phantasms. One which ensures his first shot doesn't miss, based upon the trust his son had for his aim. In the extremely rare event that this first arrow does miss, a second will activate absolutely guaranteeing a hit on his greatest enemies. Both arrows distort causality to ensure a hit, in much the same way as Ku Holland's gay bulg. Fitting for an archer, Arjuna Altar gives William Tell the divinity of Vayu, the Indian god of wind, enhancing the destructive might and range of his arrows. Again, however, Arjuna is terrible at choosing his allies, as William Tell at first refuses to obey, because doing so entails killing children. In response, Arjuna considers these feelings defective and uses his power to erase the memories Tell has for his sons. Ultimately, these three Lokapala only serve Arjuna through circumstance, fear, or manipulation, which is great for us. Naturally, along with an alter ego and fantasy tree, this lost belt also has its own cryptor, the mysterious and fabulous Scandinavia Pepperoncino. As you might have guessed, this is not the guy's birth name, that being Aro Miorengi, but out of respect, I'll continue to call him Pepe. As a descendant of the Miorengi mage family, he was raised to practice Shugendo, or Tengu arts. It was a twisted form of martial arts that corrupted practitioners to be more akin to a Tengu. Now, depending on our perspective, Tengu in Japanese mythology can either be protectors or harbingers of war. For instance, our beloved Ushiwakamaru was trained by a Tengu, and her valiant exploits paint Tengu in a positive light. For the Myorenji, however, becoming a Tengu meant becoming a hellish demon, falling into hell as a result of mastering the arts. Ever since the Myorenji's founding mage formed a connection to a Tengu in the mountains, his descendants would train to learn one of six abijna, or knowledges of Shugendo. In this endeavor, Pepe was a prodigy, mastering not one, but three of these Tengu arts before ultimately rejecting the practice as evil. After all, most of the Myorenji children were kidnapped from the lands beneath the mountain, forced to master these Tengu arts or be left to die for not keeping up. As far as Pepe was concerned, these children were doomed to either die or find hell through practicing the arts. Thus, before he descended the mountain, Pepe used the techniques he learned to murder the entire family putting an end to the Miorenji line. This is when Pepe changed to his ridiculous name and became a freelance mage. While traveling, he met Marisbury Animisphere and was recruited into Caldea's Team A for his fighting abilities. There, Pepe eased a lot of the tensions between Team A's members, with his amicable charm serving to unite them. It is through these bonds that Pepe continues to fight as a cryptor, despite bearing no hatred towards Caldea as his enemy. After all, Mashu was also one of the Team A members he developed a bond with. He hides his true potential, but his knowledge of the Tengu arts give him superhuman speed in combat, the ability to read people's intentions, and even sever himself from the cycle of reincarnation. Right from the get-go, Pepe isn't in support of Arjuna Altar's world, but he stuck around to try and liberate the innocent people under Arjuna's rule. 
His servant fit the Lost Belt's theme as an Indian hero, Ashvatama, another warrior from the Mahabharata. He was the son of Drona, and in the Great War, he allied with the same side as Karna, fighting against the Pandava brothers. In battle, he benefited from being the half-incarnation of Shiva. His skill was admittedly greater than Karna's, and he was clever enough to fight with both physical and strategic might. While formidable, however, his army and allies ultimately lost. His men, his father, and Karna died in combat, with his lord Duryodhana in a critical state. Maddened with rage, he broke his pledge as a warrior by resorting to cowardly tactics. In the dead of night, he snuck into an enemy camp and slaughtered thousands of his enemies in their sleep before being forced to surrender. Of his victims, Ashvatama shot an arrow that killed a pregnant mother. Her child was to be the last born of the people of Kuru, and so the baby was protected by Krishna. As punishment, Krishna placed a curse upon Ashvatama that would bring him pain and suffering for the next 3,000 years. When Pepe summoned him as a servant, this curse wasn't active, but it lingered as something Arjuna Altar would take advantage of. Again, Pepe didn't support Arjuna's idea of a perfect world, but Ashvatama stood no chance against such a divine amalgamation. Instead, Arjuna stole Pepe's servant contract, forcing Ashvatama to obey by implanting Krishna's curse in him. This curse essentially made Ashvatama immortal, as he would bounce back even from the most fatal of wounds. With this acquisition, Pepe is shit out of luck, and Arjuna has a total of four Lokapala. It's worth noting that while Ashvatama fights with a giant flaming wheel, he also possesses Shiva's ability to travel back in time. More on that later. In addition to the servant summoned for Pepe and Arjuna, the counterforce also summoned two free servants of its own that we encounter. The first is Lakshmi Bai, often referred to as the Indian Joan of Arc for her effort fighting the British Empire in the Indian Revolution of 1857. During this time, the British East India Company denied Lakshmi Bai the chance to govern Jhansi after her husband died, citing a doctrine of lapse that refused to acknowledge her adopted son as heir. In turn, refusing to give up her land to the British, Lakshmi Bai took up arms for a rebellion. Her bravery and determination inspired soldiers, many of whom were female, to join her cause and fight the British army. Her rebellion persisted even after Jhansi Castle surrendered in 1858, but she was ultimately killed by a bullet while commanding on the front line. While she was named after Lakshima, the Indian goddess of fortune, her unfulfilling end formed a connection with Lakshima's sister, Alakshmi, the goddess of misfortune. Thus, when summoned as a heroic spirit, Lakshmi Bai is possessed by an aspect of Alakshmi as a pseudo-servant. This results in some interesting powers. On one hand, she is able to invoke her noble phantasm Nahin Denge to form a protective barrier based on how she risked her life against the British, while at the same time unleashing an anti-army attack from her sword. On the other hand, Alakshmi's influence can render her clumsy or vulnerable. It can make her a target for attacks that weren't even aimed at her. In addition, she attracts and can, to an extent, even control the Kali, though she doesn't realize it yet. This is because Alakshmi married the demon god Kali, who was said to appear during the Kali Yuga, the final Yuga of the cycle. As a free servant, Lakshmi Bai empathizes with the people of India who suffer from Kali attacks, especially those who have lost memories of people dear to them. While the villagers may not be able to remember their loved ones, they can sense that something about their memory isn't right, that something's missing. Lakshmi Bai takes in all of the villagers who wish to fight back against their fate, forming a rebellious army protected by a fortress to the north. Together, they fight both the Kali and Arjuna's sacred beasts. Surprisingly, however, this rebellion's efforts have yet to be so much as a blip on Arjuna's radar. As such, he has yet to deem them evil, though it's a dangerous gamble they're playing as he could change his mind at any moment. Our last free servant is yet another pseudo-servant named Ganesha. Put bluntly, Ganesha is mainly the servant form of Jinaku Karigiri, a character from the game Fate Extra CCC. Now, Fate Extra can get really complicated, so I encourage you all to check out my other videos on the topic if you aren't familiar with it. While FGO has included Fate Extra in its Seraf singularity, Jinako never featured in it, so this is her first appearance in the mobile game. Basically, Jinako is a shut-in. Her parents died when she was 14, and ever since, she used her family's fortune to live as a recluse. Instead of attending high school, she got into virtual gaming and became a champion. In the world of Fate Extra, Earth itself was kinda going to shit, 
So Jinako, like many potential masters, transferred themselves to the Moon Cell's virtual environment, Seraph. In the Moon Cell Grail Wars, she summoned Karna, whom we've been mentioning all over this video. Sadly, as a recluse, Jinako was terrified of fighting in the war, and instead hacked into Seraph to form a hiding spot at the school's janitor closet. Karna, being the charitable guy he is, treated Jinako with kindness. He was loyal and most wanted to see her prosper, and yet she was fated to be deleted if she didn't claim victory in the Grail War. In fact, she only survived because Karna gave her his armor. It's thanks to Karna that Jinako had the courage to work with the other masters in that Grail War, and like other pseudo-servants, she was chosen to be a compatible host for a Divine Spirit when the Counterforce summoned her for this Lost Belt. That Divine Spirit, Ganesha, is worshipped as the Hindu god of beginnings, success, and wisdom. Others call him the Remover of Obstacles. In legend, Ganesha was the son of Shiva and Parvati, more technically a god born from the filth on Parvati's body. Ganesha was created in order to stand guard while Parvati was bathing, though in a rather foolish blunder, Parvati informed neither Ganesha nor Shiva of each other's existence, so when Shiva came to visit her, Ganesha stopped him. Angered by this, Shiva tore off Ganesha's head, not realizing it was his own son. Parvati mourned the loss, prompting Shiva to undo his mistake, but at that point Ganesha's head could no longer be found. Making do with what was available, Shiva instead restored Ganesha with the head of an elephant. And while Ganesha was initially a god made to be an obstacle, he became worshipped as a god who removes obstacles. I assume this is what made Jinako, a talented hacker, so compatible, and as such Ganesha uses her body as a vessel. While Jinako doesn't go by her name, instead deferring to Ganesha, it's still her consciousness that seems to be in control. As a result, she is terrified about the task put forth for her by the counterforce. She knows she's supposed to fight against the Lost Belt, but she lacks the confidence to do so, instead just hanging out in the mountains in her statue form. It's worth noting that she still has all of the memories from when she had Karna as a servant in the Moon Cell. Again, that's a lot to digest, so let's go over it again real quick. This Lost Belt deviated from proper human history when Arjuna, the Pandava hero, became burdened by the bloodshed caused through warfare, and he took it upon himself to make a perfect world. He absorbed the powers of practically all of India's gods, ascending his Arjuna altar. To purify the world of its flaws, he shortened the Yuga Cycle, forcing the people of India to endure a cycle of death and rebirth on a frequent basis. Each time Arjuna recreated the world, he would remove the things he found evil or unnecessary. Ashiya Dolman, who works for the alien god, is excited that this accelerated Yuga cycle might collapse on itself, so he makes things even worse by helping Arjuna. Together they summon the Lokapala servants that will do Arjuna's bidding. Our boy Pepe doesn't take kindly to this messed up system and opposes it with his servant Ashvatama, only to have it backfire in his face as Arjuna steals his servant. Thankfully, none of these Lokapala are the most stable or satisfied working for Arjuna, but in opposition, we only have two counter-servants to resist them, one of whom is too scared to even try. Regardless, Kaldea, who knows nothing about all of this, is eager to venture out to the Lost Belt, this time accompanied by Captain Nemo. He's still stubborn about revealing his identity, but he comes along so that we can activate a device called the Aranax Phantasm, which we'll need for our journey to Atlantis later down the line. Part of this process involves converting the plain old Shadow Border with the gear needed to become Nemo's noble phantasm, the submarine Nautilus. Soon after Zero sailing to the Indian Lost Belt, Ritsuka gathers three servants to help explore the area. This includes Kaldea's version of Netza, the one who's helped us many times now. The strong connection between Chinese and Indian variants of Buddhism make Netza perfect for the job, considering Parvati is too exhausted from the Oku event to come with. Then we have Rama, whom we introduced way back in America. He's the king of Kosala, the central hero in India's other epic poem, the Ramayana. While I mentioned him before, I'll reiterate that a key part of his legend is how he's tragically separated from his sexy wife, Sita. During Rama's travels, Sita was abducted by the demon king Ravana, and while trying to save her, he enraged the wife of King Vali. She placed a curse upon Rama, such that he will never be able to joyfully reunite with Sita. The curse is strong, making it so that tragedy intervenes whenever the two lovers try to embrace. While in legend, Rama and Sita are reunited after death, their servant incarnations still suffer this curse. Regardless, Rama intends to do whatever it takes to protect his beloved wife. Now, recall the goddess of fortune, Lakshima. 
Well, it turns out that Sita is an avatar of Lakshima. And so when Rama finds out about Arjuna's divine burrito, he vows to save Lakshima, who was absorbed in the process. Last but not least is arguably the star of the show. That's right, it's Karna, the son of the sun god, the hero of charity. Who better to take along when your nemesis happens to be Arjuna? With these servants, Ritsuka sets out into uncharted territory. Right away, we notice three important things. First, the fantasy tree, Spiral, is in clear view and seems to be healthy. Second, there's this giant cube in the distance that looks an awful lot like the moon cell. The people of this lost belt call it God's Sky Boulder, but they have no idea what it is. All they know is that it's been around as long as they can remember. We'll come back to that later. Third, despite being heroes of India, Ritsuka's servants note that they feel strangely weaker than usual. Thanks to this, rather than heading straight for the tree, we decide to play it safe and investigate the nearby village of Bichu. Now, a Lost Belt wouldn't be complete without a righteous or innocent NPC for us to befriend and ultimately mourn when we dismantle their world. This time, that person is Asha, an adorable girl who befriends us even when the other villagers give us the cold shoulder. You see, we've arrived near the end of the current Yuga cycle. As such, the village is all beaten up. Kali attacks are on the rise, and the villagers are more prone to being assholes, to say the least. Not Asha, though. She welcomes us to the village and introduces us to her dog, Vihan. By the time we meet her, however, she's already been a victim of Arjuna Alter's cruel system. While she doesn't realize it, she used to have a much larger family that were truly happy together. Between various Kali attacks and world restorations, however, much of that family has been erased, along with Asha's memory of them. All she has left are Vihan, her aunt, uncle, and her father Ajay. A group of Kali attack, causing the villagers to hide in their homes. We instead fight them, even defeating the sacred beasts that come afterward. To be fair, both creatures were trying to kill us. Despite saving the town, their elder, Prakash, condemns us for daring to attack God's messengers. Realizing we're not welcome, we leave the village, but Asha follows along and gives us some bananas as thanks. Aww. We learn from her that nobody in this Lost Belt knows of stories like the Ramayana or Mahabharata. Assuming they even occurred, Arjuna has long since erased them. She then explains the short Yuga cycle and how soon everyone will be killed, but those that God loves will be resurrected at the start of the new cycle. Living like this is just part of the Lost Belt's culture. Asha, for instance, doesn't celebrate her birthday annually, but is hoping her father will remember that she's almost 4,000 days old. Lastly, she asks if we're gods based on how we fight. Hoping to find more servants, we ask her if she's seen anyone that seemed like gods, and she says one such person like that came to her village before heading to the mountains. With that, we part with Asha in search of new allies. In the mountains, we meet Pepe, who's not nearly as hostile as we expected him to be. He is without a servant, after all. Our Netza searches the area from above using her wind fire wheels when she is spotted by Arjuna's berserker Netza. Recall that Arjuna's Netza is unstable, forced to tolerate being merged with a being akin to her father. As such, seeing a pure Netza enrages her, and the two of them begin to fight. Sadly, thanks to the added divinity, Arjuna's Netza promptly kills ours before retreating. Holy crap, we've just barely started and already one of our servants is dead. Thankfully though, we find our first free servant. It's Ganesha, though we just think she's a statue at first. After a startling battle, we learn what's going on from her. She's reluctant to help us out, but seeing Karna changes her mind. Again, Jinako remembers everything about her time with Karna in the Moon Cell, but Ganesha implores her to keep that a secret. Although Karna doesn't know how or why, he too seems oddly nostalgic. We've seen before that even though servants aren't supposed to recall their other incarnations, it's still possible for them to sense such things as vague moments of deja vu. It's like how Avise Braun remembered being a douche to his master in Fate Apocrypha. Multiverse shenanigans, I suppose. Anyway, Ganesha agrees to join our party. The next morning, we head back to Bichu, but now that it's the Kali Yuga, the final Yuga in the cycle, the environment is even more decrepit than before. The Kali attacks are stronger too, and while we fight them to protect the villagers, Ashvatama shows up. While we fight him, we note that our attacks aren't leaving any lasting damage. To make matters worse, Berserker Netza and William Tell also show up, along with Arjuna Altar atop his Vimana. Karna tries to address Arjuna, but is flatly ignored. 
Instead, Arjuna deems us failures and begins to charge his noble phantasm. Pepe, having lost his servant, knows he'll be erased by Mahapralaya and joins us as we run the fuck away. He clues us in to the fact that we can use a jump to void space to escape Arjuna's attack. Pepe's cooperation earns both Mashu and Ritsuka's trust, so we take him along on the shadow border to begin our zero sale. Problem is, we don't have enough time. We'll be just a few seconds too late to escape, and in order to save us all, Karna decides to make a noble sacrifice. He exits the border and deploys his armor, Kavacha and Kundala, to shield the border from Mahapralaya. Before being consumed by the blast, Karna places his hopes in Ganesha, hitting Jinako right in the feels. This buys us just enough time to flee to void space, so that we're not erased as Arjuna remakes the world to begin the next cycle. When we return to the Lost Belt, it's at the Krita Yuga, which is peaceful and prosperous. Accompanying this, we notice how the villagers of Bichu are far more welcoming now, except for Ajai. He's still a dickhead. We're glad to see Asha again, but devastated to learn that her dog, Vihan, is no more. She doesn't even remember having a dog. Turns out, during our fight with the Kali, some furniture landed on Vihan and injured his leg. This was apparently enough for Arjuna to deem him unnecessary, so the pupper was erased. Damn it, Arjuna! Now this shit's personal. Our next step is to seek out Dewar, a village to the north which is rumored to be the home of a rebellion against Arjuna. We go there and sure enough, we find the rebels being led by Lakshmibai. At first, she assumes we're more of Arjuna's Lokapala, but after we save the rebels from an attack by sacred beasts, she joins our cause. She tells us that she's a pseudo-servant containing Lakshima, and this riles up Rama thinking she's his wife, or has his wife somewhere in there, I guess. She kicks his ass and we move on. We feel confident enough to try and visit God Sky Boulder now that it's a more peaceful Yuga, but when we get near, we find it swarmed with Kali. Unwilling to fight our way through, we return to Dewar. There, we find it being attacked by Berserker Netza. As we battle her, we note that she's using too many noble phantasms in a row. Essentially, she is intentionally committing suicide, reasoning that her death is a better alternative than letting Kubera's divinity take over. She vanishes, but not before telling us about the other Lokapala and their respective locations. Recall how our servants were feeling weak ever since we arrived? Well, when Berserker Netza vanishes, a bit of that burden is lifted, giving us the idea that we can grow stronger by defeating the other Lokapala. After some debate, we reason that Asclepius would be the best servant to oppose first. We head to his territory in the south, and we learn from the villagers there that he's actually saved them from a spreading epidemic. While Asclepius is a talented doctor, we can't accept how he's on Arjuna's side. We fight against his army of the undead, but find ourselves overwhelmed. It's then that we're saved by an unlikely hero, David Semvoid, one of the other cryptors. His servant vanquishes the rest of Asclepius' undead, prompting Da Vinci to discover that the servant is actually a grand servant. Sadly, their identity is hidden by an ominous cloak. Mind you, Daybit is not here to save Caldea, but rather to relay some information to Pepe. Apparently, by traveling along with Koyan Skaya, it's possible for a cryptor to enter and exit Lost Belts as they please. Before heading back to his own Lost Belt, Daybit gives Pepe a clue on how to defeat Arjuna Altar. In fate, gods are born and derive power from human worship. The more a god is revered, the stronger they become. Of course, the inverse is also true. If the people's awe of a god can be called into question, said god will grow weaker. We see Lakshmibai's rebellion as a starting point for diminishing Arjuna's divinity. Ideally, we could recruit more rebels, further weakening him. Sadly, however, when we return to Dewar, we find it taken over by the sacred beasts. While we fend them off, the base is too damaged to salvage, and so we take the rebels to Bichu. Luckily, the village elder is still being kind to us, and welcomes the refugees with open arms. That is, until the next morning. Time has passed into the next Yuga, and along with it, the villagers have once again grown paranoid and angry. Whatever home we had for the rebellion before is now gone, and to make matters worse, more Kali and sacred beasts attack. William Tell begins to snipe them from outside the village, eventually targeting Ritska. Mashu can only block Tell's arrows for so long before letting one slip past, so it becomes imperative that we take him out as soon as possible. Problem is, we have no way of closing the gap between us, or so we think. Recall how Lakshmibai is actually inhabited by the goddess of misfortune. Turns out we can use that to our advantage. 
Ritsuka, Mashu, Rama, and Lakshmibai take a horse-drawn carriage to intercept Tell and his arrows. Tell has a number of targets he could strike, from the horse to the carriage wheels, but thanks to a Lakshmi's influence, Lakshmibai can draw any loosed arrows toward herself. Essentially, by making herself a target, Lakshmibai can take the arrow strikes, in turn protecting the others. While each of these arrows wounds her, none are enough to bring Lakshmibai down. This closes the gap and allows Rama to fend off Tell for now. Our demonstration of bravery finally encourages some of Bichu's citizens to take up arms against their god. We stick around and train them to fight, which continues until the next Kali Yuga, the end of the cycle. The Kali becomes stronger, combining to create even greater monstrosities. It's at this point that Asha's father steps in to fight the Kali too, to protect his daughter. In a show of affection, he uses his lumberjack axe to save her from Akali, and clarifies that he does remember her upcoming birthday. To ruin this moment, Asclepius returns, this time with a new divinity he inherited from Arjuna. The new power comes from Varuna, the god of the sea, and Asclepius uses it to strengthen the sacred beasts around us. Things appear to go his way until, just like Netza, he begins to self-destruct. Turns out that his body can't contain the power of two gods, and attempting to do so overloaded him. Asclepius realizes that Arjuna knew this would happen, and intentionally let him take on a second god because he was no longer useful. Asclepius takes this as a betrayal, having foolishly believed that Arjuna was any different from the Greek gods who punished him in life. Thus, another of the Lokapala fall, and we regain even more of our strength. As if to ruin the parade, though, William Tell shows up once more, firing arrows at the rebels. This continues until Asha, wanting to join the fight, picks up a crossbow and aims it at Tell. This triggers something in him as he hesitates to fire back on a child. While Arjuna erased the memory of his sons, it seems Tell can't fully betray his protective nature. This hesitation allows Rama to rush in and deliver a fatal strike. At the last moment, however, Tell is saved when Ashvatama comes to attack us. By this point, we're cutting it close yet again, as Arjuna begins to charge his noble phantasm. We don't have a way of killing Ashvatama, and we certainly don't have the time to waste trying. Thankfully, William Tell believes us when we tell him about his son, and to offer us a chance to escape, he shoots Ashvatama in the leg. We make a run for the shadow border, and along the way, we find a familiar face. It's Koyanskaya, except her new sexy outfit is all tattered, and she's looking to hitch a ride on the border with us. Turns out, Koyanskaya, despite being a fellow alter ego of the alien god, doesn't agree with how Ashia Dolman's been conducting all of this. She overestimated her strength in a fight against Ashvatama earlier, and got her ass whooped. Now, she's stuck in the Lost Belt, unable to escape, with Arjuna more than ready to erase her. She teases us about the prospect of using this as a moment to take advantage of her, and as tempting as that would be for a doujin, we instead take her along as a gesture of goodwill. All aboard the Shadow Border, we prepare another Zero Sail while Arjuna is about to unleash his noble phantasm. In this endeavor, we get some extra help from William Tell, who aims his crossbow at Arjuna. Of course, a mere arrow would normally be unable to hit such a divine being, even if that arrow comes from an expert marksman. As such, the first arrow misses, but we can't forget about Tell's legend. He carries with a second arrow, one meant to slay his enemy should the first arrow miss its mark. Following this logic, Tell looses his second arrow, which does manage to strike Arjuna. It doesn't really do any damage, but it does give Kaldea a bit of extra time in escaping the Cataclysm. Once again, another Yuga cycle begins, which means even more aspects of the world have been purged. Obviously, William Tell is gone, and while that again strengthens our party, we're taken aback to learn that all of the rebels who took up arms against the Kali are now gone, including Asha's father. Now, Asha lives with her aunt and uncle, unable to remember her dad even though she knows something is off. In the wake of this tragedy, some confessions take place. Lakshmibai, who doesn't understand the Lost Belts, interrogates Ritsuka about what happens when a Lost Belt is denied. She didn't realize that, no matter how hard she fights for the Lost Belt's people, they are all doomed to be erased one way or the other. At the same time, she tells us the truth about a Lakshmi, and how teaming up with her will only cause more hardship. Regardless, Ritsuka accepts her, and she in turn agrees to oppose Arjuna as a common enemy. We may be in a bit of a rough spot, but at least there's only one more Lokapala to worry about. 
The party seeks out and finds Ashvatama, and as we fight him, we learn about how he's only cooperating with Arjuna because of Krishna's curse. If he could somehow rid himself of the curse, he would be more than happy to fight with us. Luckily, Rama has a solution. He takes the curse from Ashvatama and carries it himself. Because both Rama and Krishna were avatars of Vishnu, the curse affects Rama to a lesser extent. It still causes Rama great pain, but it's a worthy trade-off to gain a new ally. After all, Ashvatama has a risky yet feasible plan to severely weaken Arjuna's divine authority. Here's the logic. If we can demonstrate that even someone as powerful as Arjuna can make mistakes, failing to even notice something he would have otherwise erased, then it will demonstrate to the world and himself that he's not as perfect as he claims to be. This will cripple him, giving us a chance to actually defeat him. Ashvatama states that if we could create something in the world that was there from the beginning, something as constant and unsuspicious as the sun or sky, Arjuna would never question its existence. Ashvatama, with his link to Shiva, and still connected to Arjuna as a Lokapala, can use the noble phantasm Mahakala Shakti to send someone thousands of years back in time to create this constant element in the world. It is something he can only do now that Arjuna's short Yuga cycles are putting tremendous strain on the world. Specifically, Ashvatama sends both Lakshmi Bai and Ganesha back in time so that they can use their noble phantasms to create an impenetrable barrier that they have to maintain for thousands of years. Between them, Lakshmi Bai has it easy. She only has to use her noble phantasm Nahin Denge to protect the space that Ganesha creates. Ganesha, on the other hand, must use her noble phantasm Ganesha Vinishvara to create a space to inhabit for as long as it takes to reach the present. In other words, Ganesha will be staying awake as a shut-in for thousands of years. Jinako acts like this is no big deal, a chance for her to play all the video games she's kept in her backlog, but it's obvious that such a task may break her mind over such a vast expanse of time. Regardless, she takes on the challenge, honoring Karna's final request. Thus, Ashvatama sends the two of them back, while the party fights against a swarm of sacred beasts. When we're nearly overwhelmed, the Shadow Border shows up to escort us to where Ganesha and Lakshmi Bai have been all this time. God Sky Boulder. That's right, the strange cube we noticed upon arrival was actually the bounded field created by those two all along. It's been surrounded by Kali because of Lakshmi Bai's misfortune. The reason nobody questioned the Sky Boulder is because it's been around for so long, and once Arjuna realizes he's ignored his own enemy all this time, it will surely damage his divinity. In the border, we head out to retrieve Ganesha and Lakshmi Bai, but Arjuna intercepts us with Vimana. From the air, he shoots at us with beams of light, and the only reason we survive is because Gordolf is behind the wheel, pulling some crazy initial D shit to dodge all the blasts. We don't even have time to deal with the Kali, we just charge right through, kick ass. After taking shelter under the Sky Boulder, Ritska touches it, making contact with a Ganesha who's long since lost touch with reality. Thankfully, she saved records of her past and uses them to return to normal. Ashvatama vanishes, having used all of his energy to pull this stunt off. Unexpectedly, this plan bears even greater rewards. Oddly enough, when Arjuna Altar erases elements from the world, they aren't completely destroyed. Rather, everything he's erased can be found in a formless trash heap of sorts, an empty space removed from the passage of time. When Ashvatama vanishes, he goes to this space and finds Karna, who's been drifting along since he made his sacrifice earlier on. Now that Arjuna's divinity has been damaged, the two of them figure it's possible to somehow let Karna escape and return to the outside world. Before that, however, Karna makes use of this timeless space to spar with Ashvatama, growing stronger and stronger in what seems like an instant. Thus, when Karna returns to us, he is far more capable than before. He even seems to recall his memories of Jinako, calling her by name. Hoping to settle things with his rival once and for all, Arjuna Altar awaits Karna for a final battle beside the Lost Belt's fantasy tree. We hop into the border once more, only to find that the tree itself is surrounded by a sea of milk. In Indian mythology, the world was created by churning the sea of milk. Vaski, the Serpent King, was used as a rope to churn this milk, and doing so made Vaski vomit a corrosive poison that would destroy even servants. While we wonder how to cross this ocean safely, Captain Nemo finally decides to reveal his identity. Let's not forget, he was an Indian prince who went into self-imposed exile. This may have allowed him to venture the seas in his submarine, the Nautilus, but it came at the cost of abandoning his homeland. 
In contrast, Lakshmi Bai was a warrior who stood her ground to protect her home, and so when she volunteers to sacrifice herself for Kaldea's sake, he decides to take action. Between the legends of Nemo viewing the sea as a place with no obstacles and his connection to the Greek god Triton, Nemo is more than capable of navigating even a poisonous ocean. Thus, he unleashes his noble phantasm to transform the shadow border into the Nautilus, letting the party cross over to the fantasy tree where our final battle awaits. In preparation, Rama deems himself unfit for combat. The curse he inherited is harming him too much to be genuinely useful, and so he hands over his weapon, Brahmastra, to Karna instead. Karna now has the power of three Indian gods. Naturally, there's his connection to the sun god Surya, but now he has a bond with Ashvatthama's Shiva and the power of Vishnu through Rama's weapon. By taking all three of these powers into himself, he ascends as a form we call Super Karna. It is this power that lets us ultimately defeat Arjuna, but our victory is helped even further as Karna further points out flaws to his character. After all, Arjuna deep down is still a human with emotions like envy and hatred. He's been judging the world all this time, but never stopped to judge himself for those same flaws. Ultimately, it is Arjuna's obsession with defeating Karna that allows him to lose. He falls, releasing the gods he absorbed. All that's left is to take down that damn tree, but would you know it, Pepe suddenly decides to oppose us after playing buddy-buddy all this time. He may have disagreed with Arjuna's rule as a Lost Belt King, but that didn't mean he was ready to abandon his post as a cryptor. Sure, he's got his Tengu arts to make him strong enough to fight a single servant, but that alone wouldn't be enough to defeat our entire ensemble, especially now that Rama no longer has to worry about Krishna's curse. Problem is, Pepe is not alone. Karna used all his strength in the prior battle, even giving Rama his weapon back. As he vanished, the part of him containing Shiva, in other words, Ashvatthama, took over. Making due on his role as a servant, Ashvatthama joins Pepe for one last showdown. Of course, Ashvatthama's immortal strength came from the curse, so no matter how pumped up he is, we can still beat him. Thus, when we destroy Ashvatthama, the fantasy tree also falls, settling the matter. Pepe is curious as to why Ashia Doman didn't help out for this fight, but it turns out that he was occupied with another matter. Asclepius, being such an amazing doctor, resurrected himself with a medicine he created. By letting himself die and then reviving himself, he was able to escape Arjuna's divine control. In an act of rebellion, he fought against Ashia while we were fighting Pepe. Ashia gets his ass handed to him, and his body crumbles. It's awesome, but don't get too excited. That's apparently not his only body. With the tree gone, Pepe hitches a ride with Koyanskaya, who despite teaming up with us on occasion is not at all on our side. It's a complicated relationship. They're off to the Atlantic Lost Belt, but we still have business to attend to here. We part ways with Ganesha and Lakshmi Bai, as they have fulfilled their role as free servants. Lakshmi Bai comforts herself by exclaiming how her own beliefs include reincarnation, so even if the people of this Lost Belt are erased, she believes they will still exist in some form. Our end goal is to go to a specific location to activate the Aranax Phantasm, but before we do so, Mashu requests that we make one more stop at Bichu. There, she tells Asha about her father and the other people that were taken from her. Similar to Lakshmi Bai, Asha wonders if the people who are gone will reincarnate, not through Arjuna's power, but based on her own prayers. We leave her feeling confident about this theory. Meanwhile, Asclepius spends what little time is left in this Lost Belt, helping a boy cure his sick mother. That night, likely the very last night for the Lost Belt, Asha goes to sleep crying, dreaming of the family she can't even remember. With that, the Lost Belt is denied, and proper human history takes one step closer toward survival. It's a sad process, but you have to remember that it's not Caldea's fault the Lost Belts were being pruned. No matter who wins, entire worlds filled with deserving life will be erased, as the universe itself was never going to preserve them all to begin with. Because of this, we can't give up, and so we look toward the future, activating the Aranax Phantasm in preparation for the next Lost Belt. Look forward to more of this epic tale as it unfolds. Thanks for watching. 
If you enjoy this channel, help us grow by liking, commenting, sharing the video, subscribing to Otaku Daikun, and most of all, smashing that notification bell so you don't miss out on all of our anime discussion, lore, or Let's Play content. You can support us directly through Patreon, Subscribestar, or our YouTube membership, all of which come with benefits like exclusive vids and early access. As always, celebrate, celebrate your, your fandom! fandom.